Welcome everyone. It's September 5th, 2022. This is the Jenkins Governance Board meeting. Topics I've got on the, I see on the agenda include news. Uh, oops, oops, and I've got a bad indentation here. Sorry, let's fix this indentation mistake. Plug in adoption process improvements. There we go. All right, upcoming elections. CDF topics, if any, Jenkins IO website improvements and forums and community topics. Any other items that need to go on to the agenda? Okay, then let's let's go ahead. So in terms of news, the LTS comes out Wednesday. Thanks to so many people who have done so much to get us ready for this. That will be the release that the first long-term support release that no longer includes Java 8 support. Uh, thanks to Chris Stern as the release lead. Uh, and thanks very much to Basel and to others who've done an amazing amount of work to get it there. There will be a CDF blog post coordinated with, or that will happen on the same day. And of course, the change log, the upgrade guide, et cetera, on Jenkins.io. Any questions on the upcoming long-term support release? Okay, no. next, top, next topic then is action items. Uh, these still no progress, no further progress to report. The Linux Foundation funds transfers have started. Kara and Alyssa definitely made progress, but I hadn't seen two weeks ago any progress there. Not sure what the current state is. Um, let's do a quick look and see if I've still got access. Ah, I think that is an increase. Good, so the funds may actually have arrived now. Very good, all right. Thanks, that one is resolved. Okay, DocSig mailing list transition, not started yet, probably won't happen until October at the earliest, possibly November. A blog post for Contributor Summit. I'm prone to just drop it given my inability to get this one done. We've got so many other things happening. Any objections if I drop this one? Didn't, wasn't there just a post about something? There's a new, the next contributor summit will be the contributor summit in September. And that definitely has lots of work going on. Uh, oh, Bruno is leading okay. that, right. Yeah, no, I'm okay with dropping it. Great, all right. And I've still got the action item to request full access to the CDF Zoom account. Um, this is... Well, one of two different paths we could take, right? Well, since I'm assuming, based on our previous conversation, one of the percent of the board that's here wants to go with the Google Group method, I think we should go with the Google Group method. Okay, good. All right. So, Mark, ask Michelle to add that group. I should make a group as an action oh. item. Oh, yes. Okay. Gavin, make okay. the group. Great. Thanks, Gavin. Can do. All right. That's the all the action items I'm aware of. Next topic was plug-in adoption process clarifications. There are two pull requests open. Uh, one is this clarification submitted by Tim Jacome to update the document to state what, what I think is a natural way to do things. If a plugin has no maintainers listed, then it is can be acceler it can be adopted in an accelerated fashion. We don't have to wait two weeks for a timeout. Um, there is no we need to wait two weeks for a timeout for a response from non-existent maintainers. Yeah, I think this is what we've been kind of unofficially doing, but mm -hmm. I kind of want to see things written down once we have it started. So I'm on board. Right. Me too. I'm plus one for it. Yeah, this, this isn't only natural because otherwise that timeout would be, I mean, it's a pointless timeout because no one can make it any shorter than what it is. But I mean, in general, it's a good idea to codify this, this implicit knowledge um, because then we can refer to it later if we 
uh, if we want to make changes to it. So I'm I'm very yeah. much in favor of codifying these implicit processes. Um, the only the only piece of feedback that I would give is as we codify them, it would be nice to include the rationale for each piece that we codify, because often in the, if you're going back in the future and looking back at these decisions, we'll we'll sometimes want to ask our past selves not only what we codified but why we codified it, which is going to be obvious to us today while we're making these decisions. Like you know, for me, it's obvious at least. Like, yeah, this is this is obvious because otherwise the timeout would uh, just always be two weeks and there's no way to decrease it if there's zero maintainers. So I mean, in this case, it's, it's fairly obvious, but in other cases, um, the reasoning might be lost to the future versions of ourselves. So that's yeah. really my only piece of feedback is how to even, find more things and include the reason. And, and even, if, even if we don't do it in the document itself, making sure that the PR that included it is documented up to, yeah. Yeah, well, so, so Basel, to be sure I understand, because I think I think this text is describing that, but it would require that you the, the reader has to do a get history dig. Whereas I thought what you were suggesting is we would prefer to put it actually in the in the text of itself with the rationale. Yeah, I mean, I, I don't feel strongly about where the rationale lives. I, ideally, I think it would be in the text itself because that that kind of forces the rationale to be summarized into the most succinct form possible. Um, but you know, I'm not fussy about where we put it. Like if it's in if it's in a, a big discussion in the pull request, that could definitely be good enough um, as long as it's captured somewhere. Yeah. Great. The, at the very least in the pull request, better in the documentation. Right. Okay. So Bruno, any comments from you on the topic? No, no, no. <laughs> Thank you. Okay. All right. So um, given that we've got approval from Vodic and from me, we've got enough approvals here. Any objection if I go ahead and merge this? Um, let's do the other one first and then come okay. back to this one just in case someone wants to come back to it. All right. Because we only really announced it like 10 minutes ago. Correct. Fair enough. Good. So let's, let's go to the next one. Uh, a proposal that what we have right now is code owners on Jenkins.io and governance documents are actually listed with governance board as code owners. This document, however, that Tim had just proposed the pull request to is actually not in the, in the governance tree and therefore was not listed under governance responsibility for code reviews. So what, what Gavin's proposing here is let's put that one under the responsibility of the governance board as well, because it is fundamentally a governance process. Um, I, should I be alarmed that the code owners contains errors? Uh, did you find an error? Yes, you should be. There's a big yellow banner in the center of your screen. Oh, oh, that, yeah, good question. I hadn't, okay. Unknown oh. owner on line okay. 29, okay. So we need to fix that. Yes, but not because of this. So. Right. This is not no, exactly right. So comments, concerns. I think it makes sense. But uh, the only question I had is how is how has this worked in the past for com for comparison? I mean, is this is this a, another case of codifying what is already a de facto policy? Um, or is this a change in I, it, it seems to me that it's just our existing de facto policy and we're just codifying it. So that, that seems fine. Well, the default editor is copy editors. Um, so I don't know if necessarily there was a, a previous one, but that plugin adoption process and is, has not really been changed in like 10 years. So I don't know if there's a previous version of it too. But I don't think copy editors should be really the one approving changes to this document. So I don't know if board is the right choice, but I don't see a better choice. And I definitely don't think it's copy editors. Particularly since copy editors right now, if I recall correctly, is, is at most maybe three people. Yeah. Tim Jacome, me, and maybe one or two others. So it's, it's not, I, I think declaring it explicitly as Jenkins board makes sense to me. I think Basel... To your point, it is largely a codification of existing practice in that we don't make changes to this document without lots of discussion. 
I could do a quick check, but I think I think the the historical evidence will show that changes to the document are are carefully considered and discussed before we ever bring them out. And assigning them the code owners as Jenkins board is a good way to make that explicit. Yeah, I also I don't think clear. there's been sorry. I no, also I don't think there's been on. changes in a while. Great. Okay. So then, then this one, I think makes sense. We go yeah. ahead and say, yes, we're going to do it. So I'm going to merge it. Sounds good. Okay. Okay. Yeah, I'm go. I'm okay with the other one being merged. I just wanted to give people an extra five or ten minutes to speak up, mm -hmm. which no, yeah, nobody said anything. So great. So I let's can't go. really imagine anyone saying anything either. Okay, and we've got approvals from. I'm on the board, therefore I'm a valid approver to to do that. We've discussed it here, and with the security officer as well. I feel pretty comfortable. I'm going to go ahead and merge it. Sounds good. All right, thanks. Okay, so merged. And merged. Put them in the order they were merged. Great. All right, anything else on plugin adoption process? Um, I do still want to codify GitHub access into that stuff, but that's not really, yeah, too much manual process right now. Are you referring to the fact that the people with GitHub write access are frequently different from the list of people that's in RPU? Not specifically. Um, right now, when a, when Let's say, for example, a plugin is adopted. Uh, one of the hosting members still has to go to the bot that's sitting on IRC and run a bunch of manual commands to give someone GitHub access. And you know, uh, there are problems with people who have been manually updating that list. And then when they come to make a change to RPU, we don't know who they are, so we can't approve or deny that request. Yeah. So. Yeah, and conversely, a problem that I've had is. When I remove myself from RPU, I don't get removed from the GitHub side. Yeah. So I frequently remove myself, um, but I think a lot of people forget to do that. So they end up not having RPU upload permissions start a factory, but still retaining their GitHub write access, which is a bit inconsistent. Yeah, and we've had a number of people that need to recover because someone's left the company, but they have Git, they have Git access, but not uh publish access yeah i mean i think in the long term my my vision for this would be to essentially write a script that would sync the github access in both directions with the artifact with the artifactory access um in other words if you've lost artifactory access you should also lose github right access and vice versa but i think it, that that effort Writing the script would be one thing. I mean, someone could do that in an afternoon, but the more difficult piece would be like doing a dry run and seeing what that would really mean in practice, because I think it could cause a lot of hiccups if we're not very careful about how we roll it out. So that, um, to me, that would be the big part of that effort was just to like dry run it and, and make sure everyone's okay with it. The actual big effort is that Artifactory is LDAP and GitHub is GitHub. And so we have no way to map the two, which is what, the original thread was talking about and um yeah so i have i have to go back and finish the proposal and the discussion but my plan was to only make initial version of the script to only be additive and not subtractive don't take away access that's not codified yet and then you know in a month or two months from now then start looking at removing access but just make it so that it adds so it's very clear this is how you do it yeah I think removing access is helpful as well. I mean, as a as a second stage of this, because there are, there are a lot of people that get pinged um, unnecessarily because they still have right access even though they're no longer maintaining something. Yeah. And it can it can send mixed messages to users when 
um, they approve a PR and they've got the green check mark, even though they're not actively maintaining the plugin anymore. Um, whereas if they if they if we remove their right access at the same time as removing um, artifactory upload permissions, then that's not only logically consistent, but it also kind of sends a unified message to uh, outside contributors, which I think is helpful. Um, but yeah, like you said, that's a much bigger project. So great. Great. All right. Anything else on plugin adoption process clarifications? Nope. Okay, next topic, upcoming elections. So our annual elections of officers and board members are scheduled for or slated for December. Gavin and Evelina are both up for re-election. Uh, we had the question last time, who's running it? I still have the action item. Sorry, I failed to do it last time. I need to uh, mark to confirm with... It's about four, 10 lines down. Uh, oh, is that where it is? Oh, yes. Thank you. Don't need to retype it. Thanks, Gavin. So this one, Actually, yes. What we, we should do is, what is the other way of doing it? Oh, yes. Right. Good. So tomorrow's intra meeting, uh, and that'll be the first day that Damien's back in the office. So good, Yay. good time to talk to him. What a nice surprise. Yes, welcome back. Here's a here's a task. <laughs> okay, I assume that we're still good with uh, let's use the same process as last year. Register through community.jenkins.io, yep. vote through the system at, at Cornell. Yep. Great. Um, usually we reserve CDF topics for Oleg with Oleg not here. I don't, I guess I've got one CDF topic a blog post coming on Wednesday for uh, Jenkins 2.361.1, written by Kevin Martins, with help and reviews from, from Basel and from a number of others, uh, highlighting some of the history of Jenkins and some of the ways that it's been evolving over time, et cetera. That's a CDF blog post, by the way. Any other CDF topics that are of concern there? I guess I should highlight one that is uh, JFrog um, is working with the Jenkins Infra team to reduce uh, data transfer costs for our repository server. So I was thinking about that today. The Helm chart um, installs plugins every time it boots up. Is mm -hmm. the installing plugins part of Artifactory or is something that we're hosting externally? That's something we're hosting uh, externally. Okay. I don't like that the Helm chart does it, but I was just wondering if this was related. Right. and. And I agree with you. I don't like the way it does it, it does that either. But it's yeah, it's that's using only Jenkins mirrors, not okay. using Artifactory. I don't I don't think there's anything to discuss here. But I'd like to mention during this meeting a big thank you to the Linux Foundation for restoring the Jira server last week when it went down. That was uh, much appreciated from our side. Yeah, good point. Uh, I was looking at um, at the hosting. We've only had three outages, only three outages in eight plus months. Thanks to their hosting. That's a lot better than we used to do when we hosted it ourselves, dramatically better. So much appreciated. And more up to date, more secure. Yes, and, and much less likely to be vulnerable to security issues, to be patched currently. Yeah, they're doing a, a much better job hosting it, it's great to have their services. Any other CDF topics? So next topic then is Jenkins.io website improvements. This one, I have to show you a demonstration. Let's open the Jenkins website and let's go to 
I'm always impressed by the organization of your bookmarks. <laughs> well, I, if I didn't live and die with bookmarks, it would, it would be a bad thing. All right. So first, thanks to Vihan Thora for his work on pipeline steps reference. Uh, notice this little filter steps thing at the top. It used to be that when I wanted to find out how to do a checkout, I would do control F and search through this page. And it took me three or four false hits before I got to the place I wanted. Thanks to what Vihan did, now I type checkout. There it is. Very nice. Next step, when I would press the checkout thing and open it, it would take a frighteningly long time to load because all sorts of content is hidden under these expandable, expandable elements. Well, thanks to what Vihan did, he's now separated those expandable elements out so that when I click on really large ones like this one, it gives me a hyperlink and takes me to a new page that is much smaller than the original page in, in mass, much easier for my web browser to process and much more comfortable for me to navigate. So special thanks to Vihan. It's, it's been absolutely delightful at how well that work has gone, reminds that contributions to open source are much more than just pure software. In this case, he did software that creates documentation. How long has that been live for? Um, more so than a day or two? This one has definitely been live for more than a day or two, yeah. So if it was- If you search in the top right, I could go look, but if you search in, does that, I'm just worried that this is another page that they're just flooding our already broken search with more data. Uh, there are certainly there are certainly several more pages. Yeah, but I don't think this has made it any worse. Okay, okay then. That's that's my concern is that uh, I don't know how. I really kind of want to like not use the Agolia doc search and just use Agolia itself and do it manually because then I, we can control it a lot better. But I don't know how they're mapping and stuff. And I like some of these pages are going to return results we don't care about for search, you know? So I was just worried about that. But as you said, it doesn't look like that's the case. We're good. I, I didn't I didn't see it as dramatically worse, although I yeah. see that our Algolia search, our doc search page search is getting worse and gets getting steadily worse. Yeah. So we've still got the ticket on infra to find a way to fix that doc search definition so that it uses their new thing instead of the old thing we used before. Yeah. Um, and I do want to figure out more about that pipeline syntax generator because I, we have talks about putting someone's information and in, probably this specific information into the plugin site. And I would love to start uh, auto linking in the forms as well. So if someone says the word checkout, it comes to this, well, the previous page. Mm -hmm. So yeah, those are other ones I want to, I, someone or I want to look into some point. Right. Good. So there's also another move in place. We had, we had attempted an initial look and feel improvement from a, a new contributor, ended up that we had to pull it out, but we've got another pull request now from Jan Faracik. And Tim Jacome has done some detailed checks on it. I haven't done detailed checks on it yet. There needs more. But if we look at these, this pull request, he's got a new look and feel, modularize, modularize more classes and increase the usage of CSS variables. And when we look at this in the preview, by the way, Gavin, thanks again for the preview. Seriously, seriously, thanks for the preview site. So if I show the, the preview, Here's the, the preview with the new layout. And it still looks largely the same. He made, he made some nice improvements in terms of the structure of the CSS itself. Needs more review though, because last time we went through this exercise, we broke some things unexpectedly. Any questions or comments on either of those? I've noticed reading the blog posts that the typography has improved a lot recently as well. So I don't think, I don't know if you called that out specifically, but it's been looking a lot better recently. Well, and that's something that Jan did earlier that was done a week or two ago. And, and I agree, it's, it's a, a much more readable form now than it was before. It's much more readable, more comfortable. Yeah. One of my posts, exactly.
any other topics on oh i'm muted um i would say if you want more reviews uh because at the moment i don't think anyone really gets pinged on those um throw a thing on the dev list possibly even the users list because this is not a normal java topic um because yeah uh, i can review like physically does the code look fine but i'm not in any way a layout and css kind of person so mm -hmm. it like looks fine to me right i agree it's a good suggestion i will do that that's a very good suggestion it may even be a good advocacy one for getting new contributors into the non-java space by throwing out a Twitter LinkedIn post saying, you know, do you have an eye for layout and want to get involved? This is a good thing to review. Yes, very good. Good suggestion. Thank you. Anything else on Jenkins.io? Okay, next topic then was forums and community topics. And I didn't have any particular hot ones this past week. No, Gavin, either. were there any that you wanted to flag? No, I'm going to take a quick look at the mail on this, but nothing comes to mind. Uh, event contributor summer, did you mention that already? Good, yep. Um, I think one of the boards is gonna have to sign the GitHub project action stuff. Oh, right, right, that was actions. That was posted for, like four hours ago, so. Right, for the, from, from Google Summer of Code, right? Yeah. That's a, Yeah, I don't really have any. I mean, there are a couple, we saw an increase, like every once in a while we see increases into the type of questions on the forum, but they don't seem to be actually related to a bug. They just seem to be all of a certain type coming one day, one day and then they never get talked about again. Good. Oh, there's the, uh, the one that, uh, Let's uh, promote this week the Slack one. The blog. Post. Oh right, right. Slack the Slack blog post, right? On their uh, Jenkins deployment and how they accelerate. Yes, good. That was from advocacy and outreach, wasn't it? Yeah. Yeah, I got nothing else in the forums for the last couple of weeks. All right. Any other topics that need to come to us? Oh, okay. well, you, did you want to discuss? Well, I mean, yeah, maybe later week. Uh, someone's talking about on, on the on the dev list about uh, merging and retiring old plugins that have replacements. I think it's going to be a bigger discussion and it should continue to happen on the mail list, but there was a discussion about it. Good. Okay. I think, yeah, I, think so... that, I think that contributor said that they were interested in pursuing it further, but not for a couple more months. So yeah, but there was, ideas. there was the topic brought up about what we're doing with older plugins that when the replacement has been made. Right. And I don't think we're ready to codify that yet. If okay, at all. So to, to be sure I understand the context is this things, I think the original conversation was around Kevin Martin's offering to adopt a plugin that seems to have a good successor already. There are certainly others like that, right? There's the multi multi-branch project plugin that has multi-branch, is that what it is? That is declared deprecated and the preferred replacement is pipeline, but we certainly continue to still support 
and ship or we still ship that plugin, even though we strongly recommend people, hey, please use pipeline. It's much better suited for this. Is that the kind of topic, the kind of replacement that you're envisioning, or is it something different? I just, the topic was on the forums and I'm bringing it up. I don't know oh, what we want to do okay. about it yet, but I do think okay. it's probably worth discussing in more detail. Although I feel bad that Kevin is going to get the brunt of this discussion because it's on his thread. <laughs> I get it. He's fine with it. I've talked to no, him about it. It, def it definitely cool. deserves its own thread. But I mean, um, the, the, the contributor identified a problem and did not really propose any solutions. Um, and I think that's really the next is the, you know, the, the next step is to come up with some proposed solutions. I could envision a lot of different solutions to this. And obviously it would take time and effort to implement any solution um, if it's decided on. Because fundamentally, the problem of deprecating and migrating is hard, is a hard problem. If it, if it was an easy problem, then we wouldn't be talking about this. I mean, to, it's also a perennial problem in Jenkins, um, in the Jenkins project. If you look at things like the blue ocean Docker image, you know, which is a, a great example of something that is kind of at the end of its life, but which needs a little more effort to formally deprecate and to help users migrate to the replacement. Um, and this kind of thing requires you know, documentation, training, support. There's a lot of dimensions to it. And it's fundamentally a difficult task. And there's, there's reasons why a lot of people continue to use very old technology, just because that migration barrier can be difficult sometimes. So it's it's a worthy challenge, um, but also not a not a simple problem either. So yeah, definitely I mean, uh, something that interests me a lot because I've done a lot of these migrations over the years and I, I have an appreciation for how much effort it takes, but also how worthwhile it can be once the entire community has migrated over that enables us to uh, innovate more quickly once we're all on this on a common ground rather than being kind of bifurcated into all these different um, usages. So something that I'm very passionate about, but also a lot of work. And I can, I can, um, I would definitely look forward to that contributor if, if, if in a couple of months they still have an interest in this. I think there's a lot we could do to come up with some solutions and try implementing some of them. Yeah, I, I mean. I have of the same thing. I like to, you know, reduce, clean up, organize, but I tend to stick to less the people ones and more the code ones. So like I went into the Jenkins IO and actually finally got rid of all the old HTML files, all the old markdown files, moved everything to ASCII doc, that kind of thing. And I stick to in that area because it does involve a lot less people to get a lot less involved. And I think in this nature of any open source project, you're going to have a lot of people that have a lot of opinions and then things stall out. And I especially have a lot of trouble following up when things stall out, especially when it's me stalling them out. Yeah, the people ones are a lot harder than the code ones, but they're also sometimes the most worthwhile ones if you do manage to succeed at them. And I, I found them very rewarding to work on those ones, even though, like you said, it's very difficult. Yeah. On that note though, because this reminded me, uh, I have now figured out how to merge uh, Gitter, IRC, and Matrix into one room. It takes involving their support, but I have done it. So uh, we now have a Jenkins infra, and I'll talk to Damien later, uh, Matrix channel that has this link to the Gitter channel, which is linked to the IRC channel. It's all three are in the same spot. So now I need to go back and start doing some of the other ones, because there was a thread we had months and months ago about merging some of them. And that'll be definitely nice because we got it spread out too thin. And if we can at least get the same topics in the same spot, that'll be nice. So I think Alex is trying to get me to do the releases one next. So hopefully when there's all the support for all the all matrix and Gitter are, are low, like they're, they're kind of not, it's not a heavy commercial product, so they only have like one, a couple of agents. So I'm hoping this week they'll get back to us and we'll have Jenkins releases into one merge channel soon. And then I just got to keep going through that list. Thank you.
the nice thing about Matrix, though, is they have a built-in migration system. So uh, I don't know about Gitter. I think Gitter is transparent. But if you're on a, in a Matrix room inside of Matrix, it'll say this this chat has moved to this channel, and you click it, and you join the new room. Mm. So it's all built in. You don't have to redirect people. I mean, the redirection is built in. You don't have to manually say, by the way, we've moved legacy conversations and have monitored both rooms and stuff. So Nice. So we're getting there. More cleanup. Thank you, Gavin. Any Anything else on, the, on that communication channel transition? Then? That sounds very encouraging. Nope. Okay, any other topics before we conclude for the day? I mean, other than the fact that I don't know what Labor Day is and why we're all celebrating it, no. <laughs> okay. All right, then I'm going to go ahead and, and call us done for the day.